Bible, turn to Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. I'm going to be looking at several biblical texts with you for these moments that I have. Lord willing, an outline of my talk will come floating around to you as I'm speaking. Most of my time will be in Galatians, but many texts I will look at. And here this verse of Scripture from Galatians 1, verse 4. The Apostle Paul says these words, Jesus gave himself for our sins so that he might deliver us from, and listen to this carefully, the present evil age. According to the will of our God and Father. Father, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit with power. Help me and help your people hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Bible-believing Christians must begin the conversation of anti-racism, and we must engage in the work of anti-racism with a biblical and theological understanding of sin, redemption, and salvation. And with a biblical and theological understanding of both how sin works in sinners to create personal transgressions and the ways in which sin works as a cosmological power to use individuals, and to use systems to create structures of racism and racial injustice. Bible-believing Christians must start with a biblical and theological analysis of the problem and with a biblical and theological analysis of the solution to the problem because the Bible is the Word of God, right? Right? The Bible is the inerrant, inspired, infallible, authoritative Word of God. It does not become the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Inerrant, without error, inspired, God-breathed, infallible, trustworthy, reliable, unfailing, authoritative. It is sufficient to give us everything we need for eternal life and godliness. Amen and amen, right? Yes. And by the way, I have long introductions to my talk, so I'm getting to the point. This is still my introduction. Yes, we must. Critically engage our culture. And yes, we must do the hard work of trying to analyze and understand race and racism and white supremacy as social constructs that have real effects in our society. But my basic point is God's Word must be the foundation to our reconciliation efforts. Let me linger here for a moment. If we turn away from the authority of the Bible, and if we minimize the centrality of the Bible and the centrality of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus in our anti-racist work, in our reconciliation work, if we turn away from the Bible, we will offer no eternal solutions to the theological problem of racism. And it is a theological problem. Therefore, here's my thesis. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ must be the foundation underneath every Bible-believing Christian's anti-racist efforts. Because the Bible is the Christian's authority under which every Christian must submit 
And the Bible is every Christian's authority to which every Christian must look to find eternal solutions and eternal answers for reconciliation and to defeat all expressions of sin and all works of the devil, including the defeat of the demonic sin of racism. So I have two points. Number one, the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the path toward the anti-racist one new humanity. From Genesis 3.15, where God promises to crush the seed of the serpent by means of the seed of the woman, to Matthew 28 verses 16 through 18, where Jesus commands his disciples to take the gospel to Jewish and Gentile territories, to John's apocalypse in Revelation 5-9, where John says Jesus purchased some from every tongue and every tribe and every people and every nation, to John's remarks in Revelation 21 and 22 that God through Christ redeems creation and creates a new heaven and a new earth. The Bible speaks clearly about God's multi-ethnic vision to redeem individuals from different tongues and tribes and peoples and nation and to restore the cosmos. Y'all still with me? God's redemption through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ includes the restoration or the reconciliation of the entire cosmos. God's redemptive plan in Christ includes, and listen to this carefully, vertical redemption. How sinners can become right with God by faith in Christ through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Romans 5, verses 6 through 10. The Bible teaches that through Christ, He horizontally redeems sinners to one another through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. And the Bible teaches cosmological redemption. How God restores, reconciles the entire universe through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Galatians 6.15, for example. Revelation 21 and 22. God does not only want you, He wants the whole world, folks. He wants the cosmos. To the point that He shed His Son's blood to redeem all things in heaven and on the earth. Paul elsewhere calls this cosmological redemptive act of Jesus through His cross and resurrection the disarming of earthly and demonic powers, Ephesians 1, Colossians 2. And He also calls it the unification of all things and all people in Christ, Ephesians 1 through 3. Through Jesus' penal substitutionary death on the cross, And through His physical and bodily resurrection from the dead, Jesus absorbs the wrath of God for sinners as their penal substitute by becoming what they are and by taking upon Himself the penalty that sinners deserve. Romans 3, 21-25 and numerous other texts. He reconciles sinners to Himself through the blood of the cross and the resurrection. Ephesians 2, 11-21. And He redeems a diversity of people scattered throughout the ages through the blood and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And He redeems those people to be one new but diverse humanity who must live in reconciled and anti-racist community with one another. And watch this, not at the end of the age, but right now in the present evil age, by the power of the Spirit. And this present evil age is an age dominated by sin, death, and the devil 
We must live as reconciled people in anticipation of the age to come. John 17, for example. The age to come has already become, begun to be inaugurated now by the apocalypse of God's invasion of this world in His Son, Jesus Christ. And by the indwelling presence and power of the Spirit in our lives, given to Jews and Gentiles who have faith in Christ because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 6. God, through the incarnation, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, begins the renewal of the cosmos now. Romans 8, 2 Corinthians 5, Isaiah 65, Galatians 6, 15. Now to clarify, this is not an over-realized eschatology, whereby I think that all of heaven happens now. But this is an inaugurated eschatology that begins now in this present evil age. Why? Because God executed His Son Jesus and raised Him from the dead and gave His Spirit to empower us as an emblem of the inauguration of the new age as we live in Spirit-empowered obedience. And that inaugurated eschatology that begins now continues until the age to come. At the end of history, when Jesus returns from heaven to earth, Revelation 19 to 22, to perfectly work out cosmological transformation. Christ redeemed us to live in an eschatological harmony with each other and with the cosmos in a real transformed and glorified world forever. When the kingdom of God will finally be consummated when Jesus returns from heaven to earth because we as his people are bound for the promised land of new creation. Which has already begun now through the power of the spirit and the cross and the resurrection. By the invasion of Jesus into this world, Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 through 7. By his cross, Galatians 1 4, Galatians 3 13. By His resurrection, Romans 4, 25, 1 Corinthians 15. By the invasion of the end time verdict of justification by faith, which enters in right now and tells me I'm already right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, which will be the same song sung at the end of the ages when I stand before King Jesus on the day of judgment. It's inaugurated eschatology is also realized by the fact that God gave us His Spirit, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, as the emblem, the seal of our inheritance. And as we as Christians live in Spirit-empowered love for neighbor, Galatians 5, 16, Galatians 5, 14, Galatians 5, 22, we prove that the end of the ages have already begun and we also prove that cosmological renewal has already begun. Because the foundation of this redemption is the vertical, horizontal, and cosmological redemption that we find only in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. That's point one. Y'all still with me? Point two. Anti-racism the cross, the resurrection, and the present evil and racist age. The Apostle Paul explains in Galatians 1.4 and 3.13 and 14 that Jesus died and in chapter 1 verse 1 that he resurrected to deliver us from the present evil age and to redeem us from the curse of the law so that we would receive the Abrahamic blessing of the Spirit. Just read Galatians 3, 13 and 14. A life lived in obedience to the power of the flesh is antithetical to the gospel because the flesh represents the present evil age and is enslaved to all of the cosmological demonic forces of evil. Galatians 4, 3, Galatians 4, 8, to 11. Further, 
a life lived enslaved to the power of the flesh and to the present evil age is also opposed to the spirit and the spirit empowering and spirit enabling life that the spirit gives to everyone who's been redeemed by Jesus's death and resurrection by faith. I have a whole line of text in my handout here and hopefully you'll get that handout as well. Just read Acts 2, for example, Galatians 3, Galatians 5, Ephesians 2, and other texts. But what is the present evil age? Well, that's a complicated question. The present evil age at least consists of a cursed universe because of sin. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 19. Which is one reason Paul speaks of the need for a new creation. Galatians 6.15 where he echoes Isaiah 65 verses 17 through 25. The present evil age also consists of false ideas. Colossians 1.21, Colossians 2.8. Wicked behavior. Galatians 5.19-21, Colossians 1.21. Depraved human beings, dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2 and corrupt systems and authorities, earthly and demonic. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, Colossians 2, 14 and 15, and Revelation 17 and 18. Revelation is about the evil system of the Roman Empire falling because of Jesus' victorious death and resurrection and his dethronement of the devil who used the Roman Empire to be a means by which these Christians suffered. In the first century. Racism is part of the present evil age. Because it is antithetical to the gospel and contrary to the spirit. Who gives us love, Galatians 5.4, Galatians, or 5.14, Galatians 5.22. And Paul says in Galatians 1.15 and 16 that God revealed his son Jesus in him so that he would announce Jesus as the gospel amongst the Gentiles. Thus, anti-racist work, the way I'm defining it, is pro-gospel work because it is pro-Jesus work and because Jesus, who is the gospel, died to deliver us from the present evil age and to give us the Holy Spirit whose fruit manifests itself by means of love. Love for ourselves, love for one another, and love for our neighbor. Just read Galatians 3.13 to 6 verse 10. I do not mean, however, everyone who is anti-racist is a Christian. I mean that there is, there is, in my view, a gospel-centered way to go about anti-racism. Does that make sense? In Galatians, a very visible expression of the present evil age and the enslavement of the cosmological forces of the present evil age is hypocritical ethnocentrism. The ethnocentrism that Peter practices in Antioch in Galatians chapter 2, and for which Paul said he stood condemned. And for which Paul rebuked him, listen carefully, Paul rebuked Peter for not walking in a straightforward manner in the truth of the gospel. His ethnocentric behavior in Antioch as he withdrew from table fellowship with Gentiles was a gospel matter. That's why Peter hears a theological lecture about justification by faith in 2.16. What brings Jews and Gentiles together is this great equalizer, the cross and the resurrection, whereby Jews and Gentiles are declared right by faith in Christ, by God, are imputed with Christ's righteousness by what Christ has done, not because of their ethnic identity, you see. Another example of enslavement to the present evil age is the ethnocentrism practiced by Paul's opponents in the churches of Galatia as they preached to Gentile Christians that they had to become Jewish to be accepted at table fellowship and to become part of the blessing of Abraham. Jesus the Jew is the true seed of Abraham. Gentiles don't need Jewish identity. Gentiles need Jesus just like Jews, by the way.
However, Paul angrily states that requiring Gentiles to become Jews to be part of the people of God is to sever them from Christ and to cause them to fall from the grace of the gospel, Galatians 5.4. Paul emphatically anathematizes those who preach and believe this contrary message of Gentile conversion to a Jewish way of life, Galatians 1.8 and 9. And he even wishes that these troublemakers who preach this other and false gospel would go all of the way and not just circumcise, but emasculate themselves. Galatians 5.12 Because Paul believes such preaching is antithetical to the gospel. That, re that God revealed in him so that he would announce his son as the good news amongst the Gentiles. And because Paul believed this gospel of false gospel of circumcision would only lead those who preach it and those Galatians who believed it to the curse of God's eschatological judgment. By eschatological, I mean this end time judgment that is to come upon the whole world that rejects Jesus Christ. Paul is emphatic that Jesus' death and resurrection, however, distribute the blessing of the Spirit to all Jews and Gentiles who have faith in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. The gift of the Spirit to Jews and Gentiles given to the justified by faith because of Jesus' death and resurrection enables diverse believers in Jesus Christ to walk in the Spirit as opposed to the lust of the flesh. And it, the Spirit enables them to pursue, hear that verb, to pursue living in reconciled harmony with each other as the people of God as we produce the fruit of the Spirit in community with one another. Just read Galatians 5, 16 to 26, beside Romans 8, verse 1 through verse 16. In fact, one example of a Spirit-empowered walk is loving your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5, 14. That fulfills the whole law, Paul says. In Christ, by the Spirit, whom you receive because of the death, Galatians 3.13 and 14, and the resurrection, Galatians 1.4 and 1.1. Those who live to gratify the power of the flesh are not walking in the Spirit. And those who fail to love their neighbors as themselves are not walking in the Spirit, but in the realm of the present evil age and the cosmological forces of evil. Those who live to gratify the power of the flesh, and racism is a power within the realm of the flesh. Just note for me, flesh here in Galatians represents a power. A power in which you live and that enslaves you. The Spirit represents the Holy Spirit who lives in you and the new age, new creation, the new realm in which you live as you walk in the Spirit in this present evil age while you're still alive. Amen. Instead of walking in the flesh, we should walk in the Spirit. God's kingdom is a multi-ethnic kingdom with a brown-skinned Jewish Messiah reigning as king filled with diverse people and diverse dialects and diverse stories, with people who have tasted the salvation of the one God, the one Lord and the one Spirit, Ephesians 4, and who have participated in the one baptism because of their participation in the death and resurrection of the one Christ. When they died to the world to live a life devoted to the crucified and resurrected Jewish Messiah. Those Jews and Gentiles redeemed by the blood of Christ and walking in the Spirit with Spirit-empowered love for their neighbors inside of the church. And listen to this, outside of the church. Your neighbor is everybody, not just your Christian neighbor. And if you walk this way, Galatians 5.21 you will inherit the kingdom of God. If you don't, you will not. The kingdom of God in the New Testament is a complex concept. In Galatians, the concept refers to the new heavens and the new earth, which Paul calls new creation. Galatians 
and which John calls the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 and 22. As one New Testament scholar says, the kingdom of God is about a person, namely King Jesus, a people, redeemed Jews and Gentiles from all over the world. A place, a renewed and transformed cosmos. This new creation begins now because Jesus died and resurrected to deliver Jews and Gentiles from the present evil wage and to give them the Spirit. Jesus' death for Jews and Gentiles and his victorious resurrection from the dead are the foundational reasons why Jews and Gentiles are recreated as children of Abraham and why we should live in the power of the Spirit in multi-ethnic global Christian community with different dialects and skin shades and male and female and rich and poor, people redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Conclusion. And everybody said, amen. <laughs> the conclusion. I ask you, is there really one new humanity in Christ? Answer, yes. Why? Because the Bible says so. Now, I would love to end it there for drama and just walk off the stage. But let me just say one more thing and I'm done because I'm one minute past my time. The foundation underneath this one new humanity is not colorblindness. It's the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the authoritative word of God. Yeah, we do the hard work of analyzing and critiquing and understanding culture. We don't take our Bibles and run to some hut somewhere by ourselves in isolation from Real people on the ground. We have our Bibles in our hands as we're seeking to understand the culture in which we live and we apply that Bible, the whole gospel, the whole gospel to all of life's circumstances for the purpose of discipling people into image bearers who live for the glory of Jesus Christ. So, may God help us do it. Amen.